Good evening. Um, my name is Yvette alwerning Time, and I'm the Executive Director of WITNESS. Um, I'm incredibly pleased. Well, if you're going to do that for me, you, you're going to be way more impressed with the people who are actually going to be on this stage. Um, I'm incredibly pleased to sort of open this amazing evening together with all of you. Um, and um, our mission is to help to to help people use video and technology to protect and defend human rights, right? We live in a time where human rights are under, particularly in America, are an unprecedented attack. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit more further in the, in the program, but um, tonight is very much about coming together as a community and looking at what's going on in America and around the world and coming together to fight for the values, the human rights values and the rights that we believe in. Um, it is my enormous pleasure to um, be able to introduce your amazing esteemed panel here. But before I do that, I just want to give you uh, give a few thank yous. So first of all, I want to thank our co-chairs, the Helen Enright and her family. I want to thank Dr. Sam Herskovitz and Gillian Gordon, who are also co-chairs. These are the people who make this incredibly possible for us to, to bring us all together, and particularly to bring what we call the next gen human rights defenders together with you in this room today. And I want to thank our benefit commission committee and the Friends of Witness, and really all of you who are making this possible tonight. Um, and a very special thank you to our friends at Al Jazeera, who came on board as our exclusive media sponsor. We have a long history with Al Jazeera, and you'll hear a little bit more tonight from them about something they're doing to really, really protect press freedom in a time where journalists are under unprecedented attack as well. So on that note, I'm hoping I can actually cajole some people to come onto this stage. And it is my incredible pleasure to introduce you to Abigail Disney. She is a, I call her a force of nature. <laughs> Um, she has been for many years a staunch advocate of women's rights. She's a filmmaker who makes films that have incredible impact. She's a philanthropist and she's an incredible campaigner and an activist. And I'm going to hand this mic over to her to lead you through the rest of this panel. Thank you. Thanks, Yvette. And thank you all for coming. And I am so excited about these ladies that we're gonna be hearing from um, because they are a pair of very incredible women who are um, using their voices in a way um, that is incredibly powerful and effective. Um, so Clea Way, right here to my right. Um, I'm gonna read this to you because I don't wanna miss anything because she's, these are wonderful humans and we're lucky to hear from them. Cleo is a poet, artist, activist, and storyteller, and author of the upcoming book, Heart Talk. She has created large-scale public art installations across the country and contributes regularly to W Magazine and Teen Vogue. A passionate public speaker, Cleo recently spoke at TED Women and has been invited to speak at South by Southwest 2018. And I'll just say I checked out her Instagram feed today, and it's pretty amazing. It's really breathtaking. And then when I went on Twitter and looked for her there, she's not on Twitter, but I saw so many references to her Instagram posts. <laughs> so she has almost 300,000 followers there on Instagram, and, um, and she's using that platform in a really interesting way, so I'm, I'm excited to hear about it. Emily May is somebody that I've known about and tracked for a long time, but haven't had the pleasure of meeting before, so I'm really excited to be here with her. She's the co-founder and director of Hollaback, in New York City, and under Emily's leadership, the organization has scaled to over 50 cities in 25 countries and launched HeartMob, a platform designed to support people being harassed online. And the People's Supper, which I love, by the way, um, a collaboration designed to repair the fissures in our relationships and bridge difference, a little obsession of mine. Um, so I'm ask a couple of directed questions first. And, and then we'll just kind of let the conversation evolve, and then if we have some time, we'll do some Q&A afterwards. And Cleo, I wanna start with you, because um, I just kind of gave some in tantalizing information about what you do. Tell us about what you're doing, especially on Instagram, and how technology figures into your work. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, 
You know, I, I just make things, um, <laughs> and, and I make things with words, and sometimes they end up on the screen in your hand, and sometimes they're on a coffee mug, and sometimes they're on a billboard. Um, and I think that, for me, my intention every morning when I wake up is to um, not only create tools, but also teach people how to use them. And so, um, you know, the thing about a hammer is that it can build a house or it can also, you know, smash your window uh, if we don't teach people how to use them. So I mostly focus on how to use words, how to use them to help you through the day, how to use them to help you restart. And I actually love being able to connect directly with my audience through social media because I really do think it makes it even more accessible to have those moments to yourself, to reconnect to yourself and um, replenish yourself so that you can feel more capable of getting through the day, or maybe getting through the day doesn't feel like getting through the day. Um, it feels more like taking on the day. Thank you, that's beautiful. So Emily, why don't you describe what you're doing, especially with Hollaback and yeah, um, we are working to end harassment in all of its forms um, and really started off um, as a tiny little blog um, run by a bunch of kids looking to address street harassment back in 2005, um, armed with these like newfangled cell phone cameras wondering like when they were going to discontinue them because the pictures on them were so terrible. <laughs> Um, and blogs, which were sure to go out of vogue. Um, and, uh, you know, and we just started telling our stories. Um, and uh, along the way, it just, there were so many stories, and there was so, such a, a nerve that was hit. It was like everyone had this story, and nobody had a space to talk about it, and everyone secretly thought that it was their fault, and so did we. And, um, and so as that, that momentum built, um, I felt really... Uh, deeply moved to try and turn it into something bigger. And my career before this was actually working um, to address poverty in, in various forms through various organizations throughout New York City. Um, and, um, and that work was so critical and, so, and still is so important. Um, and I just, uh, I thought, you know, what can, we, what can we take and what can we learn and what can we build in this space uh, around street harassment, around this area that, that nobody pays attention to, much like um, issues of, of poverty and, and inequality, frankly. Um, and, um, and so we did. And my first day as executive director, true story, they didn't pay me to, they don't even, I don't even think anybody at Witness knows this story, except for Sam Gregory. Um, I, uh, I, I had heard about Witness and, you know, and folks were like, oh my gosh, you should check, out, check them out. Like they're kind of doing like what some of the things that you're thinking about, but they're looking at human rights around the world. Um, and so I set up this meeting with Sam Gregory and I was just like, hi. I'm your fangirl. I just started an organization yesterday. We don't have a budget. I'm not paid. Uh, but you guys look like you're doing amazing things. Can you tell me more about that? And, uh, and he was uh, nice enough to meet with me and tell me all of the amazing uh, uh, secrets and, and tools of the trade. And, um, and so, you know, I've been a witness fangirl since then. So, so we have a moment. Um, you raised sexual harassment. Um, we have a moment here, guys, a cultural moment. Although I think it's really interesting that we had the same moment a year ago, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, and yet we're having the same rehearsal of surprise and amazement at how many women come out and yeah. tell their stories, and, and, and men are saying, oh, I had no idea, even though uh, just a year ago we were hearing all the same things. So We call it the annual event at yes. Hollaback. It's, it's every year. It's not yeah, just last yeah, year. Yeah. It was the year before. It's every year. Yeah, yeah. So, so the question is, what is this moment that we're in? Is it really a moment? Mm -hmm. and, um, or is it something that might just subside the way things subside? And is there something we can do to make sure that something actually tips here? Sure. Um, yes, it's absolutely a moment. I mean, look, like, it is an annual event, but, but, but every year it gets stronger and more powerful because every year people come forward for the first time, people come forward for the tenth time, and every year we get flooded particularly with men who are, uh, are, say, are rethinking 
the, their own actions, are rethinking their relationships, are rethinking you know, something that they said or a way that their friend interacted with somebody else at the bar. Um, and, um, and it's amazing. I mean, I just got an email from, uh, we had a, somebody who donated, and I sent them an email. I said, what, you know, what inspired you to donate? Um, and he said, um, you know, I uh, was rethinking this thing that happened back in college where um, I wanted to hook up a girl with a girl, and we were hooking up, and I wanted to go farther, and she said no, and I kept pushing. Um, and we're still friends on Facebook, and I reached out to her, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm looking at all this stuff happening on me with me too, and I'm thinking, I just totally screwed up, and I am so sorry, and what can I do to make it up to you? And, and she said, you know, like, I actually haven't thought twice about it. It's totally fine. And he pushed, and he was like, you know, I, I want to do something. Is there at least an organization I can donate to? And so that's how he came to us. But that thinking, right, like that's the kind of thinking that all of us, all of us need to do throughout our lives, not just when it comes to sexual harassment, but when it comes to um, racial harassment or e even the assumptions that we make and that we bring into the room with people um, when, we, when we talk to them and when we communicate with them. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, it's a moment. We're going to have more. We've had a few. Um, but it doesn't matter. If this is the moment where, you know, some people click and realize that this is important, then let's celebrate. Um, a woman. Um, you know, I, I just, I think it's so important that we make sure that we continue the conversation past the moment of shock or the moment of drama because what happens in our culture is that it happens and we get whipped into the frenzy of the scandal of you know who it is and who it was and who came out and we actually don't ever as a society heal our wounds correctly because we don't continue the conversation you know, and I was actually just saying to a girlfriend of mine the other day, I was like, you know, it's am it's amazing when someone like a Gwyneth Paltrow comes out and uses her voice, which is so loud, to say something. But I, the conversation I really want to hear her have is, how do you then go on to work with this person for 10 more years and thank him for an Oscar? Because that's what we're suffering with as a culture, mm -hmm. and that's what really keeps us imprisoned to the behaviors and the actions of the people who traumatize us and oppress us. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that is so critical mm -hmm. um, that we make sure that, that that way it doesn't turn into an annual event. It's not the annual like drama, shock, or gossip. You know, I don't want to gossip about sexual harassment. I want to heal this in our culture and heal this in our society and, 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 and work with each other to do that. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's the difference between acknowledging something's happening and getting to work on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cleo, I was struck earlier today, I was reading some of your stuff online, and you talk a fair amount about kindness and peace. And can you just elaborate on that a little bit? What's the relationship of those things? And, it, and is there a relationship between any of that and what we're talking about now? Well, you know, I mean, I, I think we all know that no one is born wanting to hurt someone else. Um, no one is born evil or racist or, um, you know, um, wanting to abuse another human being's body, mind, or spirit. And so what I really focus on in my work is us connecting to our, uh, the peace we need within and the kindness we need towards ourselves so that we can move through the world and exude those things with ease so that it, it shouldn't feel like it's inconvenient to be nice to someone. And if it does feel that way, you might want to look at how you're talking to yourself and how you're treating yourself. Um, and so to me, I think those are very basic things. I think if we kind of reflect more on how we look at things as a child, where mm. our golden rules are be nice, be kind, um, you know, um, sit down and be quiet, uh, that's, that's a way to connect to your peace. And I really don't feel like you can um, bring peace to anyone around you if you can't first generate it within. Emily, you work in 25 countries, right? Mm -hmm. um, what is it about America? Um, is it special? Is it different? Um, are we as better off as we've been telling ourselves we are? Mm -hmm. um, what have you seen internationally? Hmm. Oh, um, it's, such a, that, it's such a big question. I mean, the world is a big place. Um, 
I think that uh, what has stood out to me is um, uh, in some ways just the, the similarities of experiences um, that people experience no matter where they are, but also the differences and the, and the nuances. I mean, you know, harassment um, by the very form of, of what it is, would, you know, it, it looks really different. I mean, derogatory terms, slurs look really different from country to country. Um, I think what's moving to me is that in every place where it exists, there also exists a movement um, to resist it, a movement to address it, a movement to heal those wounds. Um, and, um, you know, having done this work now for 12 years, um, you know, I really resonate with what you're saying, too, about this is about, you know, also about peace and kindness, you know? I mean, I think after 12 years of talking about harassment, it sort of has hit me that, that harassment, um, no matter where it's happening around the world, uh, and that ending harassment, while I've been uh, told for 12 straight years that that is an overly ambitious and pie-in-the-sky goal, um, is actually a deeply low bar um, for, for what we should expect. From humanity, um, and what drives me nuts is that you know I feel like oftentimes when you talk about that higher bar, right, that kindness, that peace, that generosity, the ability to fully hear and see one another, um, people assume that you, what you're saying doesn't have teeth, it doesn't have uh, grit, it doesn't have nuance, it doesn't mean anything, um, and um, and I think that that's something that we that we need to shift a little bit inside of our work and inside of our collective movements um, because uh, that, that, right, that kindness, that peace, like that is so much work. It is so much work on self. It is so much work on family. It is so much work on community. Like ha if you have attempted those things, uh, you know that that is real, that that is not, those aren't words that you can just throw around, that they have that real and deep meaning and that they have real and deep work that's associated with them. And you know, I think it's important to remember we don't we don't heal people with hatred or shame. You know, we heal them with kindness and peace. You know, there's that saying that um, you know, um, healed people heal, hurt people hurt. So it's it's critical that we don't move through the world mm -hmm. trying to use um, the emotions from a place of anger and hurt and hatred to try to heal because that will just never work. Right. That, that makes a question well up in me because I think about Harvey Weinstein mm. and it's hard for me to imagine love and kindness. Mm. Um, but you know, He's not doing the work. Yeah. Every <laughs> important religious figure in the history of humankind doesn't make a point of asking us to be loving and kind. Mm if it weren't so hard to do. Mm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. if it were easy, they wouldn't bother to mention it. Mm -hmm. So I do know that it's the deepest challenge. But, but how are we going to, in this moment, how are we going to process the Harveys, all of them, and now Roy Moore? <laughs> um, how, how are we going to do that and move forward? Because there are gonna be a lot of men, um, and I'm sure there are, a lot of men shaking in their boots and wondering when it's coming for them. And um, they can't all be purged, right? We, 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 we do have to find a way to love them back into our society. So, um, but we want them to change. So, so how, how do we do that exactly? How are we going to find a way to communicate um, in a way that actually persuades and changes the people who've been so in love with their power and entitlement that they've used it um, to harass and diminish women? Well, you know, I think it's important to remember that um, forgiveness is not intellectual, it's spiritual. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't, forgiveness um, is a very fierce and mighty thing. It's not a, it's not passive. It, it, it doesn't say, okay, what you did is fine. It's, it still can say, I refuse to accept what you did, but I also refuse to allow you to take away my hope that I can heal from this situation and you can heal from this situation. And so I think that when you think about these people, if we, if we take away um, 
our faith in them, we take away our faith in ourselves and our faith in humanity. Um, how we view another person's capacity is a direct reflection of how we view our own. And, you know, Brian Stevenson says it best. He says, you know, we're all, we're all more than the worst thing we've ever done. And mercy is not, um, mercy is given to those who don't deserve it. That's the point. And I think that mercy is something in our culture that we've just lost. It's not a word I hear often. It's not something we talk about. And I think that when things get lost, we also um, create these new definitions for it that, that are some, is something far from what it actually means and something we, we really do need to harbor and, and be and work with to be in a beloved community because we can't be in that if we're constantly excluding other people or saying, nope, you're too evil to participate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I resonate with that. Um, a lot of the work that we uh, have been doing post-election has been through this project called the People's Supper. Um, and the People's Supper is a collaboration between Hollaback, um, a group called The Dinner Party, which works with people in their 20s and 30s experiencing traumatic loss and brings them together over dinner, um, and a group called The Faith Matters Network, which is a people of color-led um, group in the South that's looking to reinsert um, uh, narratives of, of, of race and racial justice and, uh, and social justice into religious narratives. Um, and we built this, uh, we had this idea, right, that, that, the, that there was this deep rupture, regardless of who won the election, and now we know, right, but there was this deep rupture um, in our world and in our society and between all of us. Um, and, and, that, and that that rupture uh, was going to have to be dealt with and managed in some way. And I mean, I would argue that rupture has absolutely always been there. Um, this isn't some new rupture that we just discovered a year ago. Um, but I think what happened a year ago allowed us to more deeply see it. Um, and so, you know, and so we started the People Supper. We started bringing people together across differences. We also started bringing people together just for conversations around healing for people who were experiencing this historic moment really uh, in similar ways. Um, and what's been really interesting to me in those bridging conversations, and I think this ties back into talking about Harvey Weinstein, um, is, uh, you know, for me, on a really personal level, can I hold somebody in their full dignity if they can't hold me in mine? Can I sit next to somebody and truly, deeply, openly listen to their story when they do not respect me as a person? They don't respect the people that I care about. They don't believe that I deserve protection from violence or basic bodily autonomy. Like, can I sit there and hold all of that and still hold space for them to be human. Um, and I think that, that that is, in some ways, the work that we have to do. Because I think part of our challenge as humans is we like to put people in boxes, right? Which is, you know, we like to, and it's like so easy to like throw, you know, Harvey Weinstein and put Donald Trump over in that box. I mean, there's a lot of people I very happily put in that box if you want a, a box called like, bad, go somewhere else, you know, um, but, um, and I'm not immune to this desire, right, to put the people in the box, um, but I think that, um, that ultimately that's not what healing looks like, that's not what a beloved community looks like, in your words, you know, I think, and, and I think that that is what we are trying to build, um, I, I think that is what we have to build, I think that if we just keep throwing away the people that don't um, meet our standards, then we'll never, um, will never truly be able to, to create any semblance of, I don't even want to say healing, because I don't know if healing is the right word for it, but any semblance of like growth as humanity. So, so, so what is it that men can do to, for us to help us get where we need to be? Because I know men are really, really asking themselves this. The good men that I know what are asking this question. What do you think we question. need to do? <laughs> well played. <laughs> You know, I went to see a movie called The Hangover, you know, a few years ago. We all remember that movie. <laughs> and, and I sat through it, and I laughed because it was really funny. And then I walked out of the theater, and I thought, oh, my God, what I just laughed at. Mm -hmm. How much has been normalized? I mean, totally normalized. Um, and I kind of went home, and I thought about it and thought about it. And my 
poor son, I think he was like 16 at the time, and I was like, you're not seeing that movie, <laughs> you know. And I, and I thought how many people, like as normalized as all that behavior was, all those young men, because it was pointed at young men, and the women went along kind of like, because that's what the men wanted to see. And so they were treated to an exposition in how, you know, they should expect to be treated, and the men were treated in an exposition into what they should be able to expect, entitled to expect. So um, that normalization process, I can, I can remember watching. I mean, as I thought about it after I came out of the theater, I could remember watching it start and spread out over the years. Um, and, and 30 years ago, you could never have made a film like The Hangover. Um, and, and that's when I thought, so this, so this is a place where we need, I can't, I can stand at the front of the theater and shake my fist mm -hmm. and they'll say that I'm a party pooper and I'm a mm -hmm. boring, mm -hmm. you know, feminist who doesn't have a sense of humor. Feminist all killjoy. The <laughs> rest of that just bullshit that I have been subjected to in my life. Um, or men could choose to do this. And there's a price that they have to pay for it, right? They're gonna be called pussies and they're gonna be called freaks and whatever. Mm -hmm. But if a significant enough number of men so I'm not talking about like if you see, this is what it sounds like we're talking about, if you see your friend raping someone, tell him to stop. That's not <laughs> gonna happen and you're not gonna have, meaning if it does happen, please tell him to stop. But, <laughs> um, but you know, it comes down to that. You have to recognize where this damage is happening. It's happening right under our noses and pretty much 24 seven. Um, and so you have, because that's what we've been living as women um, we've been living the mockery, the ridicule, the diminishment, the silencing, the invisibilification, which isn't a word I know, but the abuse of the English language. Um, I, we've been living it 24 seven. And so we need you to step into that with us if you really want this to change and be willing to lose some social points with people you would like to be friends with I mean, do something really uncool, like say, I'm not gonna see the hangover with you because it's, it's trash and I won't I give them my money. So those are, that's a small thing, but actually um, you're not gonna have, there's no silver bullet, there will never be a silver bullet for any social problem. And every important social change that needs to be made is going to have to be made at a granular level among individual human beings. And so we all need to go to the trouble of being constantly on the alert and on, the, on willing to, to take this on. I, you know, I, I couldn't agree more. And I also think we can organize around this. You know, I mean, listen, 15 years ago, you could say homophobic slurs on TV in a rap song, and now you can't. Because when you do, the LGBTQ community will drown you. You know, you will not be heard, you'll lose your sponsorship, you'll lose everything. And I think that when we as a community, and I think this is a perfect moment for it, can start to organize around rape culture and really teach people what that means, like what it, how it's appearing in these movies, you know, how it's appearing in song lyrics, how, how, how it's appearing on TV shows, in, in every aspect of our culture that is kind of the easiest to absorb, you know, especially for our young people. When we can organize around that and push for that to push them to say, listen, you're the source and, and this is what it's doing to us and we will no longer support this with our eyeballs or with our money until you change it and it works. And, and the LGBTQ community is a perfect example of how that works. I remember I was, like telling my brother the other day, I was like, I can't imagine if all women, you know, organized around the word bitch, you know? Like, you just would not hear it in songs anymore. You do not hear the word fag in a rap song anymore. Like, it just doesn't happen. Like, you do not hear that on a TV show or in a stand-up joke. Like, it's very shocking when you do. And anyone and everyone, I mean, you can say bitch at any point in time on your television at any point in time of the day. Um, and so I think that it's up to us also to organize around that. And, and I think that by not seeing those movies is a perfect example. I'm gonna, uh, yes and yes and yes and yes. And I'm gonna evoke my, um, my husband on this one um, because he's an awesome Where is feminist. He? Huh? Where is he? He is at home with our two year old. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and uh, no, because because I think what's really interesting uh, it, to me is the way that he 
how he shows up in that way um, and, um, and how freaking subtle it is, but how much work it is. So, you know, what he is essentially constantly doing is assessing all of the people around him and how they are responding to, um, to him and what their needs are, right? So he doesn't just like ride the subway. <laughs> Like, he rides the subway, like, scouting for, like, the pregnant ladies and the elderly lady, you know, and, and folks that just look a little bit uncomfortable that maybe need his seat. Um, you know, he doesn't just, like, engage in a conversation. Like, he's constantly watching the needs of every single person in that conversation and hyper aware of his privilege um, and hyper aware of ensuring that there are, that, that are voices that are not white men in that conversation being elevated and prioritized. Um, and it is so subtle, but it is so much freaking work. And, and I say that in a way that, that, that we all need to be doing that work. Yeah. I mean, as a white woman, like I, I am looking at this and I am watching it and I am saying like, yes, like this is exactly the kind of work um, that <coughs> I am doing and that I need to continue to do um, as I show up in conversations. And, um, and, um, and I think that that like very, in addition to, to everything my fellow panelists have said, that very personal work um, is the kind of work that when you tell people to do it, they're like, no, no, not me. I'm like the most like feminist, nice, woke guy in the world. But it's the work that if you're real about it, it's gonna take you your entire life to do it. You're never gonna be perfect at it. So might as well like get real with the fact that like you're not gonna be um, perfect, that there is no such thing as perfection and showing up with privilege. Um, so you're just gonna have to keep working and keep doing it. You know, I, I made a film that came out 10 years ago about um, women ending, a, a women's movement ending a war in Liberia, and so it's a really women positive film. And I, I thought it was interesting that I was getting asked by a lot of boys' schools to come and screen the film, which I was not expecting. And, um, and after a while, I realized there was one question that always came up, and it took eight or 10 minutes for it to come up, but because they were adolescent boys, it always came up. And the question was, I mean, we have this whole film of these women, and they're brave, and they're on the field, and they're dressed in white, and they're working together, and they're opposing these horrible warlords and so forth. And they say to me, why are there no good men in this film? Mm. Where are the good men? Um, and, you know, honestly, I went on to make a series called Women, War, and Peace, and, you know, I had to do all this research on men in war and so forth. And, and there was one day when I came home to my husband and my two sons, and I just sat there at the dinner table, and I thought, what the fuck? What's what wrong with you people? Mm -hmm. And then I remembered, I was there with my husband and my two sons, who are not those guys. Mm -hmm. In fact, all the guys I love aren't those guys, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And if you look at the film, there are good guys all over that film. They're carrying out the dead, they're negotiating the peace, they're doing a hundred things. So the question isn't where were they, but why didn't you see them, right? And what is it about what we're expecting of men and making meaning in their lives as men that makes that man invisible? And that's not something just men are doing, we're participating too. Um, but men are in many ways harder on each other about gender than they ever are on women. And they, they suffer an enormous price when they don't conform. And there was one school where I was saying this, and there was this little guy in the corner who was maybe 14 who put up his hand like this so his friends couldn't see it. And when I said that, he gave me a thumbs up. And I wanted to cry on the spot because I thought, oh my God, you poor fucking thing. I'm sorry, I'm swearing. That, um, <laughs> but I, I just thought, you know, I know what you're in the middle of, you poor thing. And like, if I could find a magic, you know, blanket to give him or something to help him make his way through this horrible moment in his life, he'll be amazing when he gets older. So that's the other thing is, you know, <laughs> The world is not being run by men. The world is not being run by rich people. The world is not being run by like one particular thing. It is being run by a very narrow swath of men and women who understand wealth and power and money as the only things that matter and the only things worth living for and who are willing to use all the aggression and force and violence in the world to make sure they get what it is they want. So it's not just women against men. It's women, and like most men, against some men. <laughs> and if you understand it that way, you begin to understand like the, the amazing rewards we look to garner all of us if we try to build toward this place. It might involve giving up some stuff you got comfortable with. It will for me too, 
Um, but it is a, a positive step in the direction of a better place. So um, are, do we have time for Q&A or, or do we have time for audience questions? Matisse, you're in charge. No? Can we, is, does anybody want to ask a question or make a comment or heckle us? No? Okay. I'm a terminal optimist. I just can't help myself. And, and I know, I saw that too. We all see that when our kids, I, walk, I remember walking to the Gap when my kids were very small and noticing that on the left side of the Gap where they were selling boys things, it was gray and blue and brown and, and army stuff and, and fatigues and the rest of it. And then over on the right side, it was like purple with glitter and so fun. And I thought, poor boys, <laughs> that is really grim. <laughs> I know they hate that. My, my boyfriend always walks up to kids and says, to young girls and goes, you look so smart, how smart are you? <laughs> Tell me the smartest thing you do. And, and I yeah. think that that's such a great way to yeah. engage young people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, my, the moral of that is, like, given how 360 degrees and constant it is, it's amazing we're not more messed up than we are. And that's a tribute to how resilient people are. And, and how we are really made of stronger stuff. And we really do have, will have the better of all of these systems and so forth. So thank you, ladies, so much. Thank you all so much.